Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, April 9th, 2015 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and I'll be chairing the meeting this evening. We'll start the meeting by having the clerk call the roll of the school committee. Present. Present. Here. 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 Present. Present. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we're going to begin this uh, evening's meeting with a with a special um, uh, presentation related to uh, not one but two proclamations, um, and these proclamations are in honor of uh, the Week of the Young Child, which is um, which is something we celebrate every April, um, and so uh, my office has prepared uh, actually two proclamations we call them the boring one and the fun one uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna read the boring one of course uh, and then I'm gonna get some help from some special guests um, who've actually uh, prepared a really special version of the fun one so uh, and the fun one actually has a school bus on it so that's kind of cool. <laughs> that doesn't happen on the proclamations very often so let me read the uh, let me read the first one this is called Brain Building in Progress Week, April 11th through the 18th, 2015, part of the Week of the Young Child. Whereas the Week of the Young Child is an annual celebration established in 1971 by the National Association for the Education of Young Children to recognize that children's early years are the foundation for later success in school and life. And whereas the Department of Early Ed Early Education and Care and its partners have declared that Massachusetts will celebrate the week as Brain Building in Progress Week, and whereas research demonstrates that more brain development occurs during a child's first five years than at any other time in a child's life, and whereas a high quality early education nurtures a child's cognitive, social emotional, and physical development and helps build a solid foundation for future success. And whereas investments in young children and their early education have a lifetime impact on young learners in terms of greater ac academic readiness and educational attainment, greater earnings, better health, reduced crime, and reduced need for social services. And whereas the Commonwealth has responded to this growing body of research by providing a strong foundation for a statewide system of high quality early education and care, and whereas the purpose of Brain Building in Progress Week is to add to this momentum by focusing public attention on the needs of young children and their families and by recognizing the early childhood educators who meet these needs. Now, therefore I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim April 11th through the 18th of 2015 as Brain Building in Progress Week in Northampton and urge all citizens to recognize and support the needs of young children and their families in our city. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and affixed the seal of the city of Northampton, David J. Narkowitz, Mayor. So, that's the, um, that's the official proclamation. And now, I'd like to recognize uh, Barbara Black, um, our, our city's early education uh, coordinator, and uh, she is going to, um, I think she's going to present. Okay, and if I could find the podium, I'd be doing good. You're there. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Mayor Borkowitz. And so we have two things that are going to happen now. One is, um, I think um, we have a very short video which is of some fifth graders from the Jackson Street School who are gonna sing a proclamation to the tune of the wheels on the bus. <laughs> and uh, do you know that song? <laughs> anyway, so we're gonna play that, and then after we play that, we have, we have several friends who came who um, would like to get a copy of the proclamation, but also would like to give um, some prizes to the school committee members. Okay, so. Or do you want to play the? And we don't know how good the sound is, so you may just get the visuals. So we think they did a great job, but we just don't know how loud our speakers are. 
it's not, it's not, a, not a reflection on the singers. to the fifth grade singers from Jackson Street and Miss O'Connell, who's the music teacher who did that with them, and Cindy Murphy. <laughs> You're out, yeah. on Roman Emperors. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> members and everybody that's sitting around the table uh, a brain building pin and a flyer about the week of the young child festival and while they do that I'm gonna just tell you guys a little bit about brain building um, so basically you know, when we talk about brain building it's what families what parents are doing every day with their kids it's when you're folding the laundry and you're talking about you know how to do it it's when you're in the grocery store and, and a child Thank says you. to you, what's that green thing? And you say, oh, it's a pepper. It, you know, so we're all doing it every day and that's the foundation for Thank you very much. Thank you very much. School. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, how are you guys? Thank you. Good. All right. And I, so what I, the other thing I'd like to invite everybody <laughs> that's here and that's watching the television. Already, got one already. Here, thanks is hey. if you have time to come on Saturday collect them off. school, so it's not going to be raining. Collect. <laughs> She's just going to jump in front of me. Thank you. Uh, we don't thank you. Uh, we're going to have a, a festival, and usually it's um, we have lots of people, lots of games, and a dump truck, the city, dump, one of the city's dump trucks and fire trucks, and police cruisers and a school bus. And it's very fun, really and it's free, and it's from 10 to 1 on Saturday morning. Thank you. And we encourage anybody with young children or who likes to spray the fire hose, even if they're not a young child, you. to come. <laughs> so hey, I love your lips. Thanks for having us. Thank you. 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 Thank you so much. I <laughs> know. Oh, you must be like a like thank you. Finn, thank you, man. So you know we, what I forgot to we, say. So we can share. Ollie and we'll Rose share. Rose. Can we share? Yeah, we'll share. 
Thank Sharon you. Sharon Street and Parker goes to lead. So and this is not um, going to bring us in. She said you're nice. Cool. Four of them are all from one family. So one of them. Okay. That's a mess up. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Barbara, and thank you to all the children for all these wonderful gifts and for reminding us about the, um, the fun activities that are going to happen at the Children's Festival. And, um, and thank you. Thanks again. And thanks, obviously, to the fifth graders. Clearly, um, you wouldn't have wanted me to try to sing that for you tonight. <laughs> uh, I'm glad we left it to the talented uh, singers at Jackson Street School. So thank you again for coming in. I appreciate it. And you're welcome to stay for the entire meeting. Right. <laughs> you might want to go home and build your brains uh, with some sleep. So. Exactly. Okay, so we'll continue on. Um, I have a feeling it won't be quite as fun uh, from here on out. But the next item on the agenda is um, the public comment period. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak this evening? I don't believe we have anyone signed up for public comment, so I'll take that as uh, no public comment. Are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Any announcements? Okay. Um, next, we will move into the consent agenda. Uh, tonight's consent agenda has several minutes that require approval. The school committee meeting minutes of February 12th and 26th of 2015, the rules and policy subcommittee meeting of March 11th, the school committee meeting of March 12th, budget and property subcommittee March 19th, school committee meeting March 26th. We also have contracts. Uh, one is with, well, the only contract is with DATCO, and that is uh, for wheelchair bus transportation, uh, $88,527. And then we have several field trip requests. We have the NHS um, ALP students going to the Connecticut Science Center and Trampoline Park in Hartford, Connecticut on April 16th. The Bridge Street fourth graders are going to the Connecticut Science Center in Hartford on May 14th. The NHS senior class is going to High Meadow in Granby, Connecticut, May 26th. And the NHS academic team is going to the National Quiz Bowl Championship in Chicago, Illinois, May 29th through the 31st, 2015. Can I have a motion to? Move to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Second. Okay. All those in favor of accepting the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is approved. Um, just say and good luck to our quiz bowl exactly team. yes exactly um, okay so we um, uh, Jonathan is actually going to be pr providing us with uh, a different presentation tonight so we're going to move past the his normal student representative presentation we are going to ask um, before we get to that for a vote on a field trip and this is actually a, a new field trip um, and so we thought it would be more appropriate not to have it on the consent agenda. This is a field trip, um, NHS students going to Cambodia in April of 2016. And I believe Kate, is Kate Todd Hunter here? She's here, yes. Um, so we'll hear from uh, Ms. Todd Hunter about, the, uh, about this trip. So I'm here. Okay. I'm here to let you know about this absolutely amazing opportunity. Um, so ask me questions. What do you want to know? I think I, I sent you all lots of paper, <laughs> lots of emails and lots of information. But if there's anything you're, you're curious about. Do you want to just give a synopsis yeah. just for the folks at home sure, who might be watching? Sure. Um, this is a trip that will be next April 2016, and it's a, an 11-day community service learning trip. And it's a trip for 16 of my students. And we will be traveling to Cambodia, where we will be spending half the time in Phnom Penh. Uh, when we are in Phnom Penh, we'll be working with an NGO, a non-governmental organization called Cambodian Living Arts. And uh, last year, I read a biographical novel called Never Fall Down. And I don't know if any of you have read this. It's an incredible book by a survivor of the <coughs> Khmer Rouge genocide. 
named Arne Chorn Pond. And I read this book and I thought I have to have my students read this in my History of the Holocaust and Modern Genocide class. And, um, and I started thinking more and more, we, we need to go to Cambodia. Um, we need to go to this amazing country. And I did some research and I found out about uh, Cambodian Living Arts and it's actually an organization that was founded by Arne, um, which is uh, basically an NGO that helps revive uh, the arts, dance, music, uh, singing, that was almost made extinct by the Khmer Rouge. Artists were targeted by the Khmer Rouge. And so we're gonna be working with this NGO. We're gonna be visiting various sites, including the notorious killing fields. We'll be working with a Montessori school about an hour outside of Phnom Penh. Um, we'll be fundraising here over the course of the next year in order to bring supplies for that school, as well as monies for the two NGOs that we're gonna work with. Um, then we're gonna fly to uh, Siem Reap, which is north, uh, northwest, and that's where the famous uh, temples Angkor Wat are. And so we'll be spending a few days in that, um, in that area, and we'll be working with another NGO, which is called the Landmine Project. And so we'll be working building wheelchairs for victims of, of landmine accidents. Um, and you know this will be coupled with meeting local people, students. We'll establish a pen pal, um, pen pals beforehand, and um, we'll also be working, um, learning how to cook Cambodian food, learning how to play Cambodian instruments. It's it's going to be really remarkable, a, a really incredible experience. Um, so that's the trip. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I saw two hands go up. I, I saw two so, hands. All right, I'll start here and then we'll go there. <clears throat> so I did read every last scrap of information you saw wow. and then researched a little bit more beyond that. And yeah. it sounds like an amazing trip. Um, my concern was just reading in the, uh, some of the warnings for travel um, about diseases that are possible and about the landmines and, and looking at the risks and, and the situation of um, the lack of quality medical care, according to most sources that was available, that if something, if a student were to get sick or injured, how is that gonna work? You would then be left with one chaperone for 15 well, children? Well, I, I, can, else I can assure you we're going nowhere near landmines. live landmines. Right. Absolutely not. Um, this organization, I'm really excited about them, and in fact, their attention to student safety is, is really the number one priority. Um, and I have every confidence in, in the organization. And we will have at least four adults, three to four adults, with these 16 kids. Um, part of uh, the cost of the program includes insurance that covers medevac, um, so medical evacuation, for example, evacuation in, in case of any kind of, of calamity. Um, we will never be more than 25 miles from a Western medicine, Western style medicine, urgent care facility. Um, and, and the truth is, I mean, this organization, I, I poured over everything myself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking over everything just, just as you are. And, um, you know, I mean, always we have to be careful. Always we need to ensure that these kids are safe. Um, but, you know, this organization has, has never had any kind of incident beyond, you know, pickpocketing in a, in a crowded, um, you know, bazaar or, or market. So I, I feel like um, in terms of, of medical attention, access to facilities, especially with um, insurance that, you know, God forbid if, if we needed to evacuate, um, that would be covered by, by a very reputable insurance company. Yeah. And in terms of, um, you know, vaccinations, in terms of um, it's, you know, standard vaccinations, you know, Hep A, for example, um, we won't need to take malaria medication. 
and so we'll be in we won't be in very rural areas will be in cities with access to, to Western medicine. Well, my initial reaction on reading it was, oh my gosh, how depressing. Really? <laughs> but oh. then I looked at it yeah. from the other side and said, yeah. oh my gosh, how um, you know rewarding to see people who have come past it. And yeah. so uh, once I, once I kind of reoriented myself, I started reading for content, and then I was, I, if, if it wasn't her, I would have some of the same concerns. She's, she's ramping up, and so we've seen this a couple, in a couple of years in the past, and- Yeah, wait till next year. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to Mars next, next time. <laughs> Is there a historical significance? Um, there will be. But it, so, uh, so I do trust you, and I appreciate the time and effort that you've spent on looking at it. I'm thrilled that it has a it has a community service learning component. Me too. I, I could ask for more than that, and it does seem like an amazing opportunity. So, um, nonetheless, it is. It's a big step. I assume yeah. that parents are going to have lots of questions. That kids are going to. Yeah perhaps even have some concerns themselves, so. One, one would think, but I already have a waiting list. The trip is full. Um, and the, the response has been absolutely overwhelming. Can so. you tell me how many, you said that you have a, a good deal of trust in the company that's yeah. running the yeah. tour. Yeah. Can you tell me, do you know offhand how many tours like this they have done already with student groups yes this is like their area of dozens expertise. or hundreds or um i would say probably i mean they've been around doing this since 2001 and they probably send out between six and 12 groups a year um, they have groups going to vietnam they have groups going to cuba myanmar burma uh, cambodia rwanda and they are actually a group of, of teachers, of educators, um, who feel passionately about community service learning, especially in former conflict zones, uh, like Vietnam, like Cambodia. And, um, and they pay, the curriculum is really quite rich. And so um, assuming and hoping that, that you all approve the, the trip, we'll actually start working with the curriculum um, and preparing students a year in advance. Um, one area of expertise with, with these educators is genocide awareness and prevention. Um, and so it's, it's just such a perfect match for, for Northampton High School, you know, for the community That's scary. in Northampton. Okay, um, uh, Carrie, and then I'll go back over to you. Um, I, I too think this sounds like a wonderful trip. My Thank concern you. is in the ratio of um, chaperones to students mm -hmm. and how you arrived upon two. I know that you said that the company running the tour has three or four adults, but I, I'm, <coughs> I'm sure that they're not going to be with you all the time, or, mm -hmm. or are they? They are. All the time? Yeah. Like We'll be together as a group 24-7. Okay. So how was that two to 16 arrived upon? Um, I mean, that's an industry standard, you know, six to 10, and I believe that for field trip requests, you all have set the guidelines of 10, I think, right? Um, one to 10. Um, so eight, uh, you know, a ratio of, of, of eight to one, I think is, is a good one. You know, I've led programs with more students than, than 16, um, and, you know, having three to four adults with the kids 24 seven, I, I, I feel good about that number. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, would, it, would it significantly change the cost if you decided to take additional chaperones? I can't take more than 16 kids. The, um, this, the program is set up in a way that's it's really supposed to be um, you know, a small group. Um, what I asked was, would it change the cost if you took additional chaperones? The chaperones would have to pay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
You have some free time next year. You won't have school, <laughs> yeah. we'll school committee meetings. There'll be it's community community service learning. I suppose a person from, from the organization, which is based in California. So there'll be three American teachers, as well as a full-time uh, coordinator who will be who's Cambodian, who will be with us the entire time. Yeah. Well. I was just gonna. I don't know what trips you've run in the past, but this one does seem. I'm sure that it's actually very well priced for what you're getting, but it is very expensive, I think, for many families. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you try and balance trips that are shorter duration and less expensive that, you know, to Europe, for, for example, to study the Holocaust for students? I've done that, yep. yep. Okay, so that's I've, how you try to strike the balance. You know, for, really for my curriculum, um, I've taken students to, to Poland, to Germany, to the Czech Republic. I've taken students to Turkey before. Um, and I'm really very proud and amazed at the opportunities that Northampton kids have access to. I mean, these terrific trips to, um, to Costa Rica, you know, to another developing country, um, trips to, to Spain, to Italy, to France. I mean, these amazing opportunities. Um, scholarship money is available if students apply for it. Um, Fundraising, individual group fundraising is, is available, and this organization can work very closely with students. Um, and, you know, I, I do have a surplus of, of funds that can offset the cost. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Ms. Hennessy? I think this is great. I mean, as Thank a you. teacher of social studies, I think it's an incredible opportunity for students to really see what's happened. and. So I have no question, just that comment. Oh, I appreciate it. Wish that. you luck, because it is a little bit of a ramp up, yeah. but it's a yeah. great opportunity for students. And, and I really think, you know, the, the kids are ready. You know, they're ready for this opportunity. Um, they're, they're so eager and so excited to see the world, and um, they, they, love, they love traveling with their teachers. <laughs> they really do. That's great. And, and we love taking them. Yeah, I, I was... I knew that um, my kids would be excited about the opportunity to go to Cambodia. I was blown away by how excited they are, how eager they are. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I also think this is a wonderful opportunity. However, it's only for 16 kids and you yep. have more than that in your class. How did you decide on which 16? Is it the first 16? Is it a lottery at that point? Yeah. And so, is it just um, the first 16 who can afford? Because you mentioned scholarships and yep. stuff like that. Yep. So. Yep. Um, I set aside two spots for scholarship students, um, and I also made it uh, first, you know, whoever could sign up first. Um, I opened it up to my History of the Holocaust and Modern Genocide students. Um, I allowed them to sign up first because they have so much background and a passionate knowledge and understanding of the history that, that I teach. Um, and then my plan was to open it up to the, to the school body at large on a first come, first serve basis. Um, and within days it was full. Are there kids in the class that didn't want, that wanted to, but weren't able to, maybe due to economics? I mean, because it seems to me that the kids who could say yes right away would be the kids who's Got the that's, that's why I. That's, that's why I was I wondering. Were, like, would the lottery yep. have been more fair as far as once of of your class, not to go beyond it, mm -hmm. but just of the class of the members of your class? Mm -hmm. That was all I was thinking because it seems to me to be a socioeconomic issue that the, the kids that come from money can automatically sign up and say yes and then pull their name off versus the kids that can't and need to go home and discuss it for days on end and everything else. So I was just wondering. Well, I, I talked about it with my students <laughs> several months ago. Um, and talk to those students and so we've been talking about it for a while um, and to register you didn't need to put any money down um, and you don't have to pay a, a good chunk of it until next January. I understand that. I'm just talking about the frame of mind. I mean, I, I know a lot of poor kids that wouldn't even really consider, well, I don't have to put the money down right now. They'd actually have to consider a lot of other things. I was just wondering, based on how you chose the 16 out of your class, I mean, beyond that, I can understand totally that it would be open, but for the 16 out of your class, I just <clears throat> was wondering on the equity of that, you know, whether or not um, I, I, you'd I ever consider doing a lottery at some point, you know, you have this amount of time to enter the lottery right. or whatever, so that everybody had an equal, not just the kids that had more money to be able to go, yep, yeah, I'm in. Yeah. Well, I, I, I talked to them a lot about it over the last few months, and, <clears throat> and I feel pretty good about how it was set up. I think it was set up as, as equitably and fairly as, as possible. 
You know, I wish I wish I could take more. I do, but I I can't. So maybe next year. Okay. Any other um, any other comments about this particular um, trip? Hearing none, I would appreciate a motion to uh, approve the uh, trip. Motion to approve the trip. Second. Okay. Any further questions or discussions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. I really appreciate <coughs> that. Good luck with your plan. Keep it posted. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, now we will um, now we will turn to our student representative uh, Jonathan Lander, and he will be giving us a presentation this evening um, regarding his participation at the CADCA conference, um, which he came up earlier um, at a previous presentation, and so this is a follow-on to that where he's going to give us some more information about it. So, are we going to be moving into PowerPoint mode again? <laughs> so we will. Um, we will briefly uh, just rearrange here. We're not going to adjourn. We're just going to move out of the move out of the line of fire. Um, and uh, do you need the lights off, please? Or it doesn't matter. Okay. Whatever you guys can see best. Okay. We'll just see how people's visibility is. <laughs> Are you trying to get rid of me? Having some more uh, technical rearrangement here. Good guns. I can't even imagine what it would be like to go to this. Yes. Finally. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. <coughs> so, well, good evening, everyone. No, oh, thank you for having me here tonight. My name is Jonathan Latendry, and I'm here to tell you about the, my recent trip to Washington, D.C. on February 1st through the 5th. Um, I was invited to the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America annual meeting and training in Washington, D.C. This was my second CADCA trip, but my first one to D.C. I'm a, I'm a founding member of the Northampton Prevention Coalition's teen advocacy group, and it is through the work that I have done with them that I that I came to be invited to this event. Yes. <clears throat> While at CADCA, I had a chance to network with teens from the East Hampton Prevention Group, um, who were there to lead a workshop on how to create a SAD chapter at your school. This teen advocacy group is a similar type of group to them. So I was excited to attend this workshop and learn more about how they were able to put on so many large and impressive events that raised awareness about substance use and abuse while also raising money for their chapter. And as you see in this photo, they, um, it's when they put on their concert for a cause back a couple years ago. <coughs> while at CADCA, I had, to, I had a chance to speak with Elizabeth Warren. Um, and during my short conversation with her, I, was, I talked about how it was so wonderful to me someone of her stature because I work at Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> I normally don't get to meet anybody, you know. Jonathan, I buy my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> With an exception to you, Mayor. Um, uh, um, and I just, I, I felt starstruck when I first met her. Um, we spoke about Northampton Prevention Coalition, the teen advocacy group, 
and the issues that teens face in Northampton around substance use and abuse. Um, I had, so I had a chance to educate her and um, Congressman Jim McGovern on what's going on in Northampton and why supporting DFC funding is so important for the work that we do to better the lives of teens. Um, while at CADCA, I also got some social media training. Um, I learned how to use uh, the social media platforms to track my posts on how the posts were performing, how to attract a larger audience, um, and how to draw on current events to boost popularity of our sites. Um, and one thing that we've done since CADCA is we've created a, a social media calendar. Um, so we're not just pushing one type of work. Like we, um, we have a schedule to where we can do um, alcohol related stories, marijuana related stories, um, positive social norms messaging for teens and, and, um, and stuff for parents as well. And since then, it's, it's worked so well. I, I go on there every single day, and I can, it's just so amazing at how, how well it, that's worked. Uh, the group meeting at Senator Warren's office was very informative and inspiring. Um, it was inspiring to meet so many people working towards a shared cause. Going to this conference really strengthened my will to follow my career choice to become a police officer. It was very important for youth to get involved in this work. Um, having been the first youth to attend this through Northampton Prevention Coalition, um, it is my hope that I'm just one of many youth who get to do uh, have the same opportunity. While at CADCA, we had just a short amount of time to visit the National Mall. Um, it was my first time going to the National Mall, and um, with all the hard work um, that we were doing there. It was, it was a lot of fun to, to see all the great monuments there that they had. Finally, takeaways. Um, so my hope, my, um, what I'm going to be doing um, from this is um, you know, to inspire other students to want to attend CADCA and become more involved in prevention work. Um, and at our teen advocacy group meetings, there's already, there's already many teens who want to go to the next CADCA conference, which is in August to uh, Indianapolis. There's already kids wanting to sign up for that one as well. So we'll see, um, we'll see when that time comes. And um, lastly, my hope is, since I'm graduating soon, is that I hope to have created a new youth position for the Northampton Prevention Coalition. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions uh, for Jonathan about um, about his trip and about the conference? <coughs> I just want to say thank you very much for the presentation. You did an awesome job. Last time that you came and presented, it was informative, but this was a lot more um, informative. It really gave an idea of what it was that you did and how it's beneficial not only to you but to other students. And I want to thank you very, very much for opening up this opportunity for other kids and also for presenting the PowerPoint. It was very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was curious, did you travel alone or were you with other uh, no, I ended East up. Hampton group, or um, we I met with the Stampton group several times there, but I ended up traveling with um, Ananda, um, Paul, Karen. I ended up traveling with them, as a, and we all stayed together as a group. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments for Jonathan? Okay. But, um, do you have anything to add? <coughs> Just that uh, Jonathan's been a wonderful asset to our group and that I really am hoping that we continue to get funding. This is not dependent on anyone here. <laughs> 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 just, just that um, we've seen other groups that can go with up to 10 students and I'd really, really would like to get more involved because I think that the group that we have right now is really cohesive and does a lot of wonderful things. We're doing a lot of photography, like awareness raising projects right now, but having the opportunity to like leave your neighborhood 
and go where there's like 500 people to 1,000 people assembled talking about the same topics and just sharing ideas is just so motivating. And so I, I really hope that we can do this with more students in the future. Excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you again, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so we will now... Um, we will now uh, have a series of votes, um, and the first one uh, regards uh, uh, the district's procedure for refusal of ELL services. Um, and I know that the director of special education, uh, Lori Farkas, is here, and so um, I will turn this over to her for explanation of this uh, vote. Is there going to be a test on this? No. It's a lot of binders. <laughs> <laughs> this is all paper. I have to read. Um, okay. Good evening. Um, before you was a memo in your packet was a memo that um, regarding the needed approval for a waiver procedure for English language learners. Um, this is a procedure that allows families to choose not to access. Um, the services of ESL teachers if their student is eligible. We've never had a student refuse services, but we are required to have this procedure in place. And while I'm here, before you vote, I just wanted to take an opportunity to tell you where this comes from and what it comes out of. Um, the need to have this waiver procedure approved comes out of our recently completed coordinated program review. Um, last week was the end of the more active part of our coordinated program review, which is uh, a review of our special education, English language learner, English language education, and our civil rights regulations and how we comply with all of those things. And I bring these three notebooks here um, are filled with our responses to those three different sets of standards and indicators that we need to comply with. Um, this process began last spring when in a pre-audit procedure that's a relatively new procedure with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education where we uploaded many, many documents and responded to some of those indicators online um, as part of their preview of our district. Um, this was followed by creating these notebooks of paper responses and um, an on-site file review of both English language learner files, which we're required to keep in central office, as well as special education files. That was followed by a week of on-site interviews and building tours, um, looking at um, our culture, how we serve both our special education students, our students with 504 plans, <coughs> and our students that are English language learners. Um, and then we had exit interviews, both with myself, Barbara, and Pam Plummer, as well as an exit interview with um, the superintendent. Overall, I, I just wanted to say, um, six years, these come every six years, and some of you may remember the previous six years, um, that it was a really positive experience. Uh, the the on-site folks, and who are the same people who do our paper review, um, felt like, the tone and the interactions and the um, collaboration in the district was really, really positive. They were particularly impressed with our outreach to the community, which I feel has been led by Barbara Black and the principals. Um, the, the many, many activities that happen both in our buildings and in community locations is pretty phenomenal. Um, the things that they noted right off the top of areas of need are no surprise because they're also found in um, Dr. Provost's entry findings. And um, the two main things that have been pointed out 
were are, um, we really need to increase our level of service for our English language learners. Um, and the second area is we need to have more options for supports for non-special education students and ways for them to access help um, in a variety of areas. And that was especially noted at the secondary level, at the high school in particular. Um, the way this process works is 30, no, I'm sorry, yes, 30 days from the end of the visit, which was last Friday, um, there's a draft report written and that sent to Dr. Provost and I. We have 10 days to respond <clears throat> to any inaccuracies and then they have 45 days to create um, a final report. And they actually don't do the report over the summer. They don't, um, we wouldn't receive one and be required to act on it during the summer. But I asked <laughs> that if it's close to the summer, it would be really helpful to be able to get the report in order to start making any changes at the beginning of the next school year. Um, but I really have to say um, the overall feeling of the, the process and their feeling when they left was very, very positive. And um, I wanted to publicly thank um, the building principals who hosted these folks in the middle of MCAS and, um, and the staff and the students that made themselves available to meet with people too. It was really, really helpful and very positive. So now you can vote. <laughs> if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. <coughs> yes. Yeah, I had a question. I, it's just because I don't know how this works. Um, this 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 policy is for once a student is determined to be eligible, then what? And what I'm curious about is who initiates the process of, you know, identifying students who are eligible and determining that they're eligible. No, it's this, everything that happens up until this policy. Find that out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, so the way it works is when students uh, register in the district, they fill out a home language survey. And depending on what the home language survey shows, if a primary, the primary language is other than English, the students are assessed by the ESL teacher from that building. Um, if it happens to be Leeds, I'm rotating teachers through because they don't have an ESL teacher in that building. And um, there are a number of tests that are administered, and then that person, that ESL teacher, makes the determination about the level of competency in English, both oral and written and reading. Um, and so that student then receives, depending on that level, receives X amount of services. So it's, it's a determination, really, of how, if, if basically, if they're flagged by the, by the paperwork just saying that there's a a non-English language spoken in the home, yes. that's the flag, and then they just get assessed to see how they function in English? Correct. Okay. Yes. Well, the only experience I have with this was a little girl down the street who, who ended up coming from exactly what you described. However, her family wanted them to stay in, it had to be weighed against staying in the Ryan Road district versus being traveling. Um, that's my concern with the, with the ELL. I mean, that we don't have enough qualified teachers in each school so that the kids can also, because the, the girl lost out on the, all the neighborhood dynamics of the friendships and everything else because she now is being bused. That's changed. All the way, okay. That has changed. So um, we have an ESL teacher in all of our schools now, um, except for Leeds, because we don't have any ESL students there. But if we did, we would shift people around so students at Leeds can get services too. So kids no longer all go to one of the schools for that? The kids, when we made that change two years ago, um, students that were at Jackson Street could choose to stay or go to their neighborhood schools. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Hennessy. I have two questions. Did you say, just clarification, are all students, when they register, required to take the home language survey? Yes. Okay, great. And then if they do waive, I know we don't have any. Yes. If they are, they still count as an ELL student. In yes. Terms of our, okay, thank you. There's, there's actually another thing they can opt out. I'm not very clear on the difference between opting out and waiving. <laughs> there are two <laughs> different <sort> terms. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes. 
the why would they opt? I mean, I can understand in the scenario I set up with the kid in the school why they would opt out. Now that it's changed, why would they choose to opt out or waive it? What would be the benefit? No, and, um, and I think it's a cultural thing, too, that some families really want their children immersed in English and don't want any, um, don't want to receive things in, in their home language, don't want to um, have their children uh, speak native language during the school day. Not that, that we interpret, but um, that it, it is a point of pride, I think, at Do we times. have educators that go out and talk to these parents, you know, like yourself or someone that goes out and just to try to dispel some of the myths that might be there or to assuage them so that they can tell? Oh, well, it hasn't happened yet, okay. so I, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not sure exactly how we would respond. It would really depend on the family. Right. Yes. So the, the, the other half then of my question, because I just thought about that, if if um, if a child's found not to, the opposite of this policy is if a child's found not to be eligible, do the does the family have are they told that their child was considered found not to be eligible? Yes. Is there a policy a procedure for them to say no? But we think this kid is el or so to be eligible. So if a family if a child is found not to be eligible or they. Um, learn enough English so they are no longer eligible by level. Right. Um, they're still monitored for two years. So that means um, there's communication with the classroom teacher from the ESL <coughs> teacher. There's um, kind of check-ins through guidance. Um, they may, if there's a concern, they may come before the student study team. So there is a requirement to monitor a student for two years. Are the, do the parents know this? I mean, they get notified if their child is eligible. It's they in, get notified if their child is sort of on this other kind of it's in, um, edge? It's in the letters and okay. the thing, the, the communication we have to send to parents. <coughs> Actually, the communication to parents is fairly complex, but it's, um, it has required elements okay. in it. Yes. Other, oh, Mr. Meyer, I wonder. I'm just trying to work through um, the waiver application language, and so it has mm -hmm. one children who already know English. The children, the child already possesses good English language skills, and it talks about they have to have scores approximately at or above state average for grade level, or at or above fifth grade, whichever is lower. Or, and then there's older children, child is 10 years or older. Now, so does that mean that? Would B always be applied, let's say if you're 14 years old, would you always apply B, or is it possible to apply <clears throat> A? So, I have to say this language comes straight out of their recommended <laughs> language, oh, that means their, their <laughs> forms. Yeah. So, um, I read it many times. So I'm just trying to figure out how you could be, because it would seem like if you're a younger child, then you would always be f the lower, I'm not. I'm trying to figure yeah, out how you could ever be. The fifth grade. Yeah, the yeah. lower of the fifth grade. Like you'd always be ten, unless you were a student who was significantly older in, let's say, in fourth grade. But then you'd fall into <laughs> the category of B. I, I, so I like a tax code. <laughs> <laughs> not being a lawyer and uh, <laughs> using a tax lawyer to do my taxes. <laughs> um, so I think. So from my conversation with the audit folks from DESE, really it appears from my understanding that the standard is that fifth grade level. Okay. But what do you do with younger children? I mean, you can't expect a, a second grader to have a fifth grade level of reading and written language. Um, so I believe that it would be that, that would be the standard unless they were at or above that age of fifth grade. Okay. Yeah, because my only concern was reading it as an or. It seems if it's an or, then that means you could have a student who was 16 years old and that they, if they would test at the lower of their grade level or fifth grade average, then the lower would be, let's say they were in 10th grade, the lower would be 5th grade, and you would right. say, oh, they could, so they could wave yes. out, because you know they're in 5th grade. Because 5th grade is really, well, you can't stop a family, and then they could opt out if you said they couldn't wave out. Right. But um, a 5th <laughs> grade is, is kind of, they say that newspapers and magazines are written at a 5th grade level. Um, it's, it's a functional level of reading and writing. 
Now, what's the difference between waiving out and opting out? I'm not 100% clear, to be absolutely honest, because a lot of this language, so a brief history is that when all the, when the law was passed, question two was passed probably seven, eight years ago. I'm looking to John because it's my memory. Um, there were a series of recommendations about how the education of English language learners should look and should be conducted. And they were recommendations and guidance. They were not regulatory. Even though it hasn't shifted into being regulatory, it essentially is regulatory now. And so now, in the last year-ish, the department has come out, and this comes out of the, the class action suit um, that was filed on the federal level that Massachusetts was not serving its English language learners sufficiently. And so a lot of what was guidance is now treated as regulatory, and they created basically boilerplate letters and memos um, to address all the different aspects of the law that, uh, that came out of question two. So, um, so this is mandated, and how it plays out in real life, we haven't had, we haven't had that happen. Our families welcome the support that they get. Well, if we were to have it happen, would there be a difference in how we treated somebody who waived out versus opted out? In both of those cases, in reading <clears throat> the guidance, um, we are required to monitor those students for two years, no matter if they come out of the service delivery because they've reached a particular level of competency or if the family is not has chosen not to receive the service. So would that be where they waive <clears throat> and if, they, if they fall under here then they, they can waive out because they've reached the, the criteria but they no, opt the, out because the, they don't? That, when they reach the level of competency it's called, and this is a tongue twister, a formerly limited English proficient student, a flat. <laughs> yeah, I can't say it fast. And um, so those students are, we're, we are required to monitor those students for two years too. Now you know. <laughs> now you know about ELLs. <laughs> the, um, any other questions uh, before we? Um, well, I just want to suggest, what I think from reading this, the difference between a waiver and an opting out is I think the waiver is something that they request and is granted by the district, and the district can only grant it if it meets these, this, this threshold, whereas opting out is something that the family can do. They can, they can just opt out with their own set of criteria. However, we can't grant a waiver unless the, these criteria makes, are met. That makes sense. I think yeah, that's I'm the difference between the two things. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, so I um, that in writing? move to, uh, <laughs> would it, do we have to move to adopt sure. this policy? I'll move that we adopt this policy. I second it. Okay. Uh, it's a procedure, but yes, it's a or policy. And, and I understand it's odd to bring a procedure before the school committee, but that's Steve. what they say I have to do. Okay. So <laughs> any further discussion? The motion was made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we now have a, um, a two consecutive uh, votes that are required, and this involves uh, Jackson Street School, uh, PTO, and it involves uh, gifts, uh, the first being um, the uh, approval of the acceptance um, from the Jackson Street PTO, the gift of a sound system and some P, uh, PE equipment, and uh, and then the second one also gift from Jackson Street PTO is for some classroom furniture, and I believe we have some PTO representation and uh, and obviously Principal Agnes is here as well. <laughs> 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 Hi, um, I'll introduce myself, Mary Clark. I'm co-chair of Jackson Street School PTO. Hello, thank you all for your incredible work. Totally appreciated, we're grateful. I'd, 
Do you, would you like me to describe what? The, okay, first of all, it's not a donation of a sound system. It was actually, we have a sound system and we have speaker monitors. But with the speaker monitors on the stage level, whenever we'd have singing or try to use one of the mics, we would have incredible feedback issues. Any of you who've been to our concerts have witnessed the <laughs> Jimi Hendrix experience. <laughs> of, of those. Yeah. So um, Tom Douglas, who's a local city architect, had, who runs our talent show, uh, because he has a fourth grader at Jackson Street, had said, if we can just put the monitors up, which I believe Ryan Road has already done, if we can just get them above, we won't have the same feedback issues. And that that would cost in the realm of $2,000 to get those mounted and then have the electrical work done to change where they are and the drilling, et cetera. So at that point, I said, is, as in the PTO questioning, is that all we need? And Ms. O'Connell said, well, if, if we could get the city electrician to do the wiring for under his job, then there might be able to ha be money to have two overhead mics so we could actually hear the kids who sing. And lo and behold, Tom Douglas, through his magic, was able to get, is it Jim Larilla? My, I don't know, a city electrician. Jim which, Malo. Jim Malo, Jim Malo. sorry, long, wrong Jim. name. Jim Malo to do the electrical work, which meant that we had raised enough money to both move the monitors and add microphones overhead. And I believe you were there, Ms. Duval, and you could, there was a tiny bit of feedback, we're still getting used to where the handheld mic has to be, but we could actually, for the first time, hear the concert, yay. So that's, it isn't actually a sound system. It's moving of the monitors, and because of the fine city services, we were add, allow, able to add those overhead microphones. So that's that part. That's that part. And that's that the classroom part. furniture. And the classroom furniture, they're called standing desks, and um, some of you are aware of the fact that these have been seen as very useful for students who have difficulty in focusing and or sitting for a length of time. Um, we have... My son could use this. <laughs> 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 we, I heard about this at a com conference one time and the PTO actually fronted us. This was before we knew we had to come every time to talk to you about this, but this was a few years ago. Um, we bought a couple of through the PTO for a fourth grade class. They piloted the use of them. And they were, they were not cheap, so we thought, oh, this, they're great. They, they have, they're standing, and they also have a bar. So while kids are writing, they can also do this. It's like three-man band or whatever. <laughs> and it really is very helpful in keeping the focus. But, and we wanted more, so our custodian actually fashioned them out of a regular desk. He had just added piping so that they were up high. So we have those all over the school now. But we realized that the, the desks that were really sought after were the desks that had the, the, this. It was a combination of standing and flipping. Um, so one of our PTO members has a, a friend whose company makes these, and he was able to secure 10 if we were able to use money from the PTO in order to purchase those so that we would have some of the ones that went like this as well as just the standing ones. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm um, not sure they got that. Could you do no, it again? Right. <laughs> <laughs> we may want to add that feature to our podium. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Jimmy. School committee members. Right, yeah. yes. I'll be a kind of barrier. It's exactly. interesting now, and just as an aside, there are catalogs that arrive all the time with not only this, but going like bicycles oh, bicycle under desks. desks, as well as seats that rock and tilt. And you know, it's you, if you spend time in schools now, you know how much movement there is in order to focus and learn. A lot of kids need a lot of ways to to do that. So 
but we're really happy that the PTO is willing to put money towards getting the ones. That I won't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so how many um, are, are you buying? Ten? Ten. And where are they going to go? They'll go mainly on the second floor for the third, fourth, and fifth graders. Um, the first, the kindergarten first and second graders have available one, but they have more of an opportunity to do work on the floor, or it's just more appropriate for them to do things that require, or can let them move, but they don't necessarily have to stand at a desk. Well, just for a matter of interest, how many of the ones that were um, made did you have, do you have in your school? I have not heard of them in the other schools, and I'm thinking if it's a need, it's a need. We have about two or three in every classroom. And they're at the back of the room, and kids just rotate when they need to stand up, and it's it's kind of a movement, so that they're able to just stand and go at a desk and stand and do their work, and then go back and sit down, and somebody else will come and stand. Do up. you find that's enough? I mean, would, would is more requested, but that's what you have room for, and that's where you're at right now. Or it's enough. The number is enough. It just didn't have the extra feature right, the of the moving the feet. Yeah. That's awesome, and thank you very much for demonstrating that. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you caught that. It makes me want one. <laughs> um, I'd like to make a motion to accept the gifts um, through the PTO. I'm not quite sure how we do that. Was there something about PE equipment? Too? Yes, there oh. was. And I also have a question, which I don't know if I ask before or after. So it, there you go. Or if I'm allowed to ask a question. What question? Uh, you can certainly ask through the chair a question. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Are you? I'm the chair. You're the chair. Hi. <laughs> chair, may I ask a question? Sure, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right. You need to vote. OK. <laughs> um, before I will happily answer the, I, the PE equipment, because I do know about the PE equipment. Um, I emailed Ms. Walzak. Hi. Fabulous email. Thank you so much, and highly detailed. So thank you. Because. As it was explained to us, and I tried to explain at the PTO meeting yesterday, that there are two parts to the issue of how things get presented in front of the school committee. And that one is there are some organizations that need to ask for permission before they start to fundraise. And that there are PTOs are assumed that we're not just heading out to Shea Albert, that we're actually fundraising for the school. And so we don't have to ask permission. I would like to suggest that PTOs are included as organizations that get permission before fundraising for two reasons. One is because then we can work together on a shared vision. And we can coordinate that vision with other PTOs and share ideas, like the standing desks. So as we as a PTO look at our budget for next year, we're, we've been soliciting information from our teachers about where are we going? What are the needs? What is the vision? And if I had a chance to be discussing that vision with the other PTOs, I'd jump on it. And if I had the chance to know that it was coordinating with your vision, so that you might say, hey, let's try to bump this up a notch. If we could all raise $50,000 more, then we solve these two problems too. How motivating is that for a group of parents to be involved in a bigger vision? It's huge. Because the flip side of it, raising all the money, getting something, and then, oh, Oh, we, we, we have to check and see if it's OK with the school committee when we've already done the heavy lifting can be demotivating to some people when we actually want to capture them with the vision of what we can all do together for our schools. So suggestion from me. And also because, sorry, I'm, I try. Well, PTOs, especially the elementary PTOs, as you all know, have very little institutional memory. By the time you're in the high school, you've been in the system a while, you know how things work. But if an elementary school PTO falls apart and doesn't have leadership for a few years, the kindergarten and first grade parents coming in trying to take over don't know what's going on. They don't know. There isn't an onboarding process. There isn't a, a PowerPoint. Say the, the Massachusetts Cultural Council has a PowerPoint for all new local Cultural Council board members to know 
what are breaches of ethics, what the process is, what's appropriate to a grant, et cetera. And there is no such onboarding, even though we are board members for the school department, in a sense. And whether or not that exists, I think there's an opportunity for both onboarding and driving a passionate and robust vision of what the schools can be. Thank you. And then PE equipment. Okay. So, what about so that was a question. So it was a question. Like, oh, yeah, I do have a question. So defer to that, defer to the My question is to can you please consider that idea of bringing the PTOs in earlier in the process? in a visioning way, or at least saying, let's combine what our visions are for the next year, what we're trying to do as a school. Dr. Perlis? Uh, so I'm asking this question very respectfully because I truly appreciate what you've been doing for the school. But it, it's, um, I'm a little off kilter that you appear to be asking us to put more regulatory red tape in your way. Um, so would, I'm wondering if you would be equally comfortable if it wasn't a requirement, but that we, you were able to approach the school committee just to make sure. Yes. Um, so in that way, you would still be free, but if you felt like you needed to get some guidance from the committee that you could come, ask to come before the committee. I think less, I, I think it would be more, and I totally see your question, I think it could be seen as regulatory red tape, or it could be seen as there's just as the NEF holds a fall in a spring meeting that there could be some kind of a coordinated moment of what, where are you all going? And I didn't even know that that's, the NEF is sort of like that, but it's very casual in its meeting as opposed to what are we, let's tell the school committee what our magic wand list would be for mm -hmm. this year. What's the PTO trying to do this year? And you get a sense and we all get a sense. Just one moment, yes. I miss, um, my, uh, here, uh, so many things are flying around in my head. First of all, we, until very recently, did not always approve gifts from the PTO to the schools. So part of this is new to us even, okay. and not just okay. to you. Thank you. Right. Okay. So we, and also a little further along on our agenda this evening is a policy about accepting gifts which addresses to some extent some of what you're talking about, but not directly and not all of what you've said. I also have a concern that at your school, first of all, there's a principal who knows what's going on. Secondly, there's a school council that is charged by the state with helping to develop a school improvement plan that would have what your school needs. If you want to talk about how to get together with other PTOs, you can have a citywide meeting of PTOs that doesn't involve this body. You all can all meet by yourselves without our facilitating, organizing, butting in, or, or anything else. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't get your ideas shared with us, but there's, there is always the potential for you to come during public session mm -hmm. and speak about as a representative of the citywide PTO or of a, co a coalition of PTOs from all schools, we have thought of these things, we would like to talk with you about these things. The school committee also creates a district improvement plan in concert with the superintendent. Those are district-wide goals, usually three to five years that we're looking at them. Your school improvement plan has to feed into the district improvement plan. So there's plenty of opportunity for coordination of things. And I'm not saying this to oh, shut no, you no, down. No, no, I'm no, saying no. this to tell you that there may already be opportunities in place for the kind of conversation that you want to have. To the superintendent's direct point, we're we're saying that if you are if you are not a PTO, if you are if if I'm just putting together some ad hoc oh. group of parents that you know wants to like. Um, go out to lunch and have a, a sports pool and take the, <laughs> the half the money yeah. from from our sports pool at lunch once a month and spend it on something for the schools. They need to check with us mm -hmm. before they start raising money in our name. Right. Okay. So that was part of the intent of the policy that we're getting ready to discuss. However. 
I think to the extent that the that the PTO is in dialogue with the principal, I hope that the principal of your school is representing what the school council would say, what her interpretation is of the school committee's needs, and and a PTO by rights should be focused more on what does your school need. These are your parents that are members. They're raising money for things for your school. so. That's, that's my take on this. Now, somebody else at this table may say something altogether different, but I feel like that you, if, if you were somebody, if you were an outside group, then yes, you do need to come to us so that you know that you're raising money that we will, that's for something that we will accept, and also so that we know and give you permission if you are raising it in our name. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it through the PTO, I think we're all square. No. Your principal has her hand so, <laughs> Maybe she's going to tell me I'm wrong. Sure. But I have something to say directly to her, but that's fine. Go ahead. I'll recognize. Yeah, I have something. Uh, things have really changed in, in the time that I've been a principal in terms of the role that the PTO plays in funding our schools. Um, the major budget cut at 2003 in our school anyway, saw a really sh big shift in the a commitment to fundraising. And we were talking about it at our PTO meeting that the PTOs combined in the elementary schools probably represent about a quarter of a million dollars for the schools now in terms of the kind of fundraising that happens. And it isn't separate from my vision or the school council vision, but the school council is a shared decision-making body. It isn't about the nickels and dimes that we need for our schools. And I think that, again, having been here so long and seeing the fact that we knew, now have more of a collaborative sense across the district, both in terms of our curriculum, trying to be consistent and coherent, as well as um, trying to achieve equity across our, our school system in terms of resources, that it, I really think it makes sense to talk together with the school committee to, to see what the PTOs can do and should do in terms of funding our schools. To be honest with you, they're gonna be a major force in keeping our programming going. I, I can't imagine otherwise. There is no way we can continue to do what we're doing without this, this force that the PTOs are. Wherever you turn, there's something that the PTOs have been responsible for. I would really welcome the idea that we do it in conjunction with our mission and our vision as far as our curriculum and our, our funding of all our schools together so that there isn't, unfortunately, there is a little sense of competition or, hey, now they're going to be standing desks. How come Jackson Street gets standing I desks? Don't, I mean, we don't want that. that. We don't want that. We don't and want that. we like the idea of sharing our ideas amongst the PTOs I like the for idea sure of, the, of sharing and I like the idea of conversation and collaboration mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is I told Walter Crowther former principal of Ryan Road this over 20 years ago that there are some I believe that it's incumbent on the city and on the school department to provide certain things to the extent that you are having to subsidize and shore up things that we can't pay for, I think that's a crime. I just think it's, it, it shouldn't be that way. Unfortunately, it is. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I, I guess I want to be cautious that the PTO isn't finding its way into paying uh, stipends for teachers or paying some kind of recurring, you know, I, it's a very fine line. I think we have to be very cautious and I don't want to discourage at all the PTO from conversation, collaboration, or from support of the schools. I just want to be sure that, um, that it, that, that any work done by the PTO doesn't take away the authority of the school committee or the school council. To be matter of so Ms. Duvall is next. Okay. I also just want to caution that we're here to accept two gifts. We're right. not here to rewrite gift policy. Yeah. That wasn't really on the agenda. Well, gift tonight. policy is on the agenda for later. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So, yes, but, but I'd like to address this issue um, directly. Um, Ms. Agna made wonderful points. The PTO has changed a lot in 20 years, and I see an awful lot of what the PTO does. And one of the things, being out there and volunteering in the schools and going to the different events, one of the things that I noticed 
is that it's not equitable. And it's not equitable not because people don't want it to be equitable or even because there's like, let's outdo somebody else. It's just a matter of somebody's expertise should and could be shared. As far as the school committee's involvement in this, um, we have liaisons for NEF. We have liaisons, legislative liaison. We have SPEDPAC liaisons. I don't understand why, oh, actually I rephrase, I think it would be a great idea to have a liaison to go to, for the PTOs. And I also think just to have somebody just sit there and say, well, we're going to have to check with that or well, whatever. I mean, I think that that would be a great idea because the PTOs do offer so much to our schools that unfortunately while we sit here, we can't offer. And to, to, to um, address Ms. Minix, they do offer technology. Those are going into our, our schools. They have, the PTOs have done wonders for our schools. And when I see um, one PTO have an auction and another PTO having an auction and I say, oh, did you know that this PTO got such and such and such? Mm -hmm. And then they yeah. did and then they yeah. got a lot exactly. more softly. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But there's an awful lot of, um, of sharing and collaborating that can be done there. And if we don't encourage that, then I'm afraid that in a way we kind of discourage it. And then we do set up the, well, it's all for our own schools. Well, you need to worry about what's happening at your school. Well, I'm sorry, but your kids are going to be JFK school, yeah. are going to be Northampton High School. And they all need to come together. And one of the problems that I've had about our schools is that, and knowing teachers, is that I say each year, well, what is it that, um, like to sixth grade teachers, what is it that you see each of the schools bringing in? And each of the schools have different strengths as far as the teacher's perception, as far as, you know, oh, these kids may have more math skills, or these kids may have more of this, or more social, or whatever. Everybody has an importance, and if we could get that importance, that all together, so that everybody can kind of fit together, maybe we can make something bigger than what it is that we just have. And I think that what you have is a wonderful idea. And I mean, I would volunteer to um, to to be a liaison for you to, for the PTOs if that's something that needed to be done. Yeah. Thank you. And if I may just address that point, we've already run into issues with the stars residencies uh, uh, by having multiple elementary schools apply for the same for the same gardener or um, the Hitchcock Center and then run into city laws that we have used a contractor for more than ten thousand dollars by the time it's spread across three or four schools at five thousand dollars each at which point it should have already gone out to bid and have had to do a lot of backtracking and repedaling, whereas if we were, we would like, I think there's a vision of having a garden in every elementary school and of having all of them address, have Hitchcock Center come so that their 21st century science standards are met in a hands-on way, in a way that the teachers can really support. But that falls afoul of laws and you only find that out after experience. And if our PTO fell apart, as they often do, the next set of people in a year or two know none of this. And so there's not a sense of coordinated institutional memory moving forward with that. But if we are trying to coordinate more, we start to run afoul. Or the idea of how even that you can use the STARS grant to pay for the garden and blah, 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 blah. Well, and also the, the difference between the different schools, um, why some schools get to take their kids to um, Plymouth Rock and others just go to Deerfield. You know, I'd like to know really why. And that, that annoys me. We should talk. A lot. Yes, we should talk. <laughs> So, and in the meanwhile, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Well, them. actually, we still, still haven't heard the PE yet. PE equipment. <laughs> yeah, finish hearing. Can we hear the PE? Alan had a question, actually. If I could. I was oh. just going to say, I don't know if this falls under rules and policy, and so I don't want to volunteer work for them. But I would be happy to to help put together a manual for the PTOs with all of the relevant information, and to at least give the school committee portion of it, so that these. These are our gift policies that apply, that apply to the school PTOs, and these are all the, so that all the information was in one place so they didn't run into these issues. And then if they decided to meet as a, as a citywide organization, we could not be attending four different, six different PTO meetings a month. We could go to their annual or biannual type mm -hmm. meetings as, repre as, as representatives. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm, I don't know what the policy is on writing policy manuals, et cetera, but I feel like it's just compiling information 
for the PTO so, so that there is some you sort of choosing a, and putting together a pamphlet of poli right, just existing a, uh, policies is fine. You right, or mind. even if it's just what is a PTO, <laughs> yeah. what is the council's jobs? Because really, if you're a kindergarten parent, you have no idea what the role of the school committee versus the school council versus the PTO. You don't really know what, what all the players are. So I'm volunteering, okay. and I'm probably going to regret it. But all those in favor, say aye. 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 Volunteering. Okay. okay so we have right. one more. E equipment. Yes. So one of the jobs, uh, as I understand it, of the PTO is to find out what the needs are in the school, and you'll be hearing from us about libraries in the next meeting, probably. At, but the uh, so in speaking to Janice Toddy, as we looked in how to use transperformance money for specialist teachers and cultural arts, and as Ms. Toddy has used, um, has done different dance and martial arts forms. And I said, well, if I could wave a magic wand for you, what would, ha what would you wish? What does your PE program need? The same way I would with the, I have with the arts programs. And she said that the PE equipment, the mats, were in very, very bad condition, and she was not sure about all the safety and about the budget, the PE budget cuts over the years for different supplies. So in this year of having to do massive fundraising for the playground, we've done really massive fundraising and have had gifts come in that aren't necessarily earmarked for the playground that could cover the new PE equipment. And the, um, it's trapezoid mats for vaulting, ordinary replacement mats for all the different gymnastics uses and a variety of Expensive. aerobic games and equipment, including um, heart strap-on heart monitors that can go from child to child so they can see where their heart rate gets to. It's a, um, a pick-up stone game that goes around so that they get their heart rate up so then that they can do its three different run stone activities to get the heart rate up so they can learn to use the monitor and know how they have to do that activity in order to get the heart rate up and pedometers so that for our walking program we can continue to get a real sense of how far they're walking. And yeah. the, the mats were there when the uh, new addition to Jackson Street was made in about 1975. Wow. That was the last time we got mats. Mm -hmm. well, my question is, what's going to be done with the old mats and stuff? I don't know that there's, I, I have no information, but I'd be happy to find out from Ms. Toddy and, or if you have <coughs> recommendations, I'm sure that would be, they have Well, I think that they should be looked into yet. for something to be able to either be sold on eBay for something or, I mean, something so to be able to offset the money. Um, and it, it's been suggested, I don't know if all the schools have exactly. quiet rooms. They go for a lot. <laughs> But mats are really good in quiet rooms where if, mm -hmm. if that's the, so that's one use. If there are more needs for that, that would be mm -hmm. a terrific use for it. Okay. Well, the reason I'm asking is a few years back, I remember when Ryan Road got rid of um, some of their gymnastics equipment to bring in more. And that was one of the issues that they had of what to do with it. And they really ended up not doing anything but wish that there had been some sort of protocol in place and had thought about it beforehand because it was a lot, I mean, even a little bit of money is a lot of money when you didn't have any. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There's a Northampton football cheerleading program that might be interested in purchasing. Exactly. So there are plenty of, we would be happy to pursue that and get back to the committee. Okay. Now? So now we, <laughs> there was a motion on the floor to approve both sets of gifts, I think. Someone started yes. to make a motion. Um, all three. Okay. So all those in favor of. We didn't get it seconded? I don't think so. thought we did have a second of it. Um, Who seconded? I didn't. Second. I will second it. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you, Mr. Meyer. <laughs> Mr. Meyer. No further discussion. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, now it's seconded. Okay, so uh, the motion is on accepting these two separate uh, sets of gifts the sound system and PE equipment and the classroom furniture. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The gifts are accepted. Thank you so much. Thank you thank for you coming. Okay. We now have uh, another gift before us. This is from the NHS PTO. This is a $1,000 gift for the robotics team. And this I will turn over to Ms. Wallach. This is $1,000 from the PTO to supplement the grant that the robotics team gets for their expenses. This just lets them cover more of the cost of the um, competitions that they attend and the supplies that they need for the program. Excellent. Thank you. Jeff, we get for the robotics team. Second. 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the gift is accepted. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. This is a vote <coughs> a gift uh, from Thomas Chang. It's $8,000 for professional development. I'll turn over to you. Yes, Mr. Chang was a math teacher working in our schools that resigned mid-year to accept another position. And while he was working for us, we had given him the opportunity to get some professional development training in math programs so that he could come back and work with our staff and our students in, the, in that program. When he resigned, he felt bad, shall we say, that that opportunity was kind of taken away with him. The expertise he had obtained at our expense through some grants was then lost. So between he and his new employer, they've indicated they would like to make an $8,000 donation back to the district so that we can actually train another teacher with the same training that he received so that that program can actually go on in the school district. Excellent. Move to approve the gift from Mr. Chang for $8,000 for professional development. Second. Second. Any questions or comments about this? Yes. I, I just want, oh, you go. I, I just think, um, I think it's a shame that the school system lost such a generous person. And I would like to, I'd like us to, you know, put that on our, in our minds of how we can keep these wonderful people in the education system. It's, it's sad to have lost him. He's so generous, so. I was just gonna say, I, I do appreciate so much that, yeah. that gesture. I think definitely. that shows a lot of integrity. Mm -hmm. Most definitely, yeah. Okay, um, your motion was made, it was seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, <laughs> vote, uh, we have a fingerprint, <laughs> we have a fingerprinting memorandum of agreement. Uh, with the, um, Northampton Association of School Employees. Uh, this is this would be a memorandum of agreement that would be supplemental to our existing collective bargaining agreement. And I will turn this over to the chair of the bargaining subcommittee, Mr. Meyer, to. Deep. So, at a previous um, executive session, we brought to you um, a proposal. You requested that we return with certain amendments to the proposal to the Northampton Association of School Employees. Um, those amendments which would require that release time be determined by the district and scheduled at the convenience of the district and also I believe in the event that a non-licensed employee chooses not to get fingerprinted during that release time as designated by the district he or she will be required to use personal time to obtain the required fingerprinting as well as um, the original terms that had you know we had tentatively negotiated which was a one-time stipend of $35 for non-licensed employees of the district um, to be paid as a stipend for reimbursement. Um, so those uh, provisions, and these are all, these are applicable to employees hired prior to July 1st, 2013. Um, so the association agreed to those changes, and so I'm bringing that forward for your approval tonight. And I just, I just want to recognize that this is, um, you know, this is a first step in what will be negotiations starting in the fall for a new three-year contract. And I think um, both sides, uh, both the negotiating um, committee for the school committee um, and the representatives for the association um, feel that this is a, a positive first step and a, a, a good step toward building a relationship that will allow us to get through much more significant negotiations um, in the fall. Any uh, questions or comments from the school committee on this item? Uh, would you make the motion, Mr. Meyer? Um, yes, so I would uh, <coughs> move that the committee ratify this memorandum of agreement regarding fingerprinting as presented. Okay. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any <laughs> opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is, uh, that is unanimously ratified, agreed to. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is a vote to <coughs> refer educator feedback uh, to negotiating team. Um, and actually we have another, another similar item, which is to uh, refer stipends unlisted in contract to the negotiating team. So why don't we take those together and I'll ask Dr. Provost to just give a background on that. Sure, thank you. Um, so the, ed the rollout of ed Massachusetts Educator Evaluation, as you know, was to take place over the course of three years, which essentially meant that 
school committees and associations would be constantly um, bargaining over the process of educator evaluation, which is part of the collective bargaining agreement. Um, so this is similar to the process we went through in the summer of incorporating enabling language for the DDMs. Um, the third part of the educator evaluation process is to obtain feedback from students for teachers and to obtain feedback from teachers for administrators. Um, so this would be uh, a request that the negotiating subcommittee meet to work on language with that. I would suggest we use the same process we used before, which is for um, the joint labor management team to get together some proposed draft language that we could then bring to the negotiating subcommittees um, for both the association and the school committee um, and um, hopefully have a favorable outcome. The, okay. second, the second item um, has to do with stipends that are not listed in the collective bargaining agreement but which have been um, we've discovered more and more have been a part of the practice of the district. Um, to date, we have about $35,000 worth of requests for um, stipends which are not in the contract. Um, some of this is for work that has already been done um, and undertaken by employees with the understanding that um, they would be compensated. So it, it presents a problem um, because these are rates that were neither approved by the school committee or the association um, and we have people who are waiting on payment and at this point um, the position I've taken is if it hasn't been authorized by the school committee I'm not in the position to allow it um, so um, this is a request for the negotiating subcommittee to meet with the um, negotiating committee for the association to determine the rates for the stipends for the current year. And as you said, we will be rolling right into another um, contract bargaining season. So it may, again, be something that sort of is one piece we can get out of the way for the future. Um, I have shared with the association, to our knowledge, the complete list of stipends that have been requested that are either outside of the contract or at rates that are different from what's listed in the contract. And they are currently in the process of <coughs> checking with their membership to see if um, they, they believe that that's the comprehensive list so that we at least know um, what we're dealing with. Okay, so this is a motion, this is a vote um, to refer both of these two items to the negotiating uh, subcommittee. So Can moved. I, okay, there's been a motion, is there Second. a second? Seconded. Okay, so all those in favor of referring these two items, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, those are referred. Next, we have a uh, required vote of the school committee uh, to postpone a previously announced retirement or filed for retirement for an employee, um, in this case, Marianne LaRoche. And I'll ask uh, Dr. Provost to explain this. I'm coming before you tonight um, in support of this request. It's actually a request for the school committee to rescind the acceptance of uh, Ms. LaRoche's retirement. Um, this is a, a case of an employee who had intended to retire, but in the process of discussions with MTRS was not able to obtain the information that she needed in a timely way to make a determination about whether or not she's actually eligible to retire this year. Um, so I fully support the request to rescind our acceptance of her retirement. Okay. Move to uh, approve the postponement of the retirement of Mary Ann LaRoche. Second. Okay. <coughs> Any uh, further discussion on that? As someone who is, I think, two years into an 18, what was supposed to be an 18-month wait for information from MTRS on, on buyback, <laughs> I, I sympathize. <laughs> okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Any abstentions? Okay. Now we have a series of reports that will be coming out of uh, Rules and Policy Subcommittee. Uh, and first readings on several policy revisions, and I will turn this over so just to the chair slowly. of Rules and Policy. Ms. Minnick. So the first one in front of you is the policy on bullying and harassment. Um, Karen Jarvis-Vance brought this to us when um, 
when this policy was written, the state had not yet put together its guidelines. In fact, our policy was used as um, almost as a template for some of the state bullying and harassment policies. Um, Karen worked very closely with some experts in the field to create and draft this policy. However, now that the state has caught up, there are some definitions that were put forth by the state and Karen has made suggestions to make our policy reflect the actual state verbiage. So their wording is what's, so the definitions in our policy are what's being changed. I believe that those are the only changes, except that there may be something that had, to, it was a housekeeping thing that had a date, I can't remember. Um, oh, no, it was, um, about the uh, program resolution system that was added. A uh, little blurb right at the end of that policy, you'll see that there, highlighted in yellow. So um, if you have, that's, those are the only recommended changes on that particular policy. The next one, oh, so again, this is just the first reading of these. Um, so this is for your information will come back to the full committee for a vote at a later time. So, If you have any questions or concerns about it, however, you're welcome to contact me or any member of the Rules and Policy Committee. The next policy is um, is that is the one on policy adoption, right? I'm looking, I keep trying to find my agenda. Yes, policy adoption, okay. So this one, um, we had uh, some lively discussion about. <laughs> um, the, the concern is that depending on how you interpret the steps involved, it could look like it takes three months or three meetings to go through our process. And we were hoping to make it clearer what's involved and also perhaps streamline the process. And certainly we've also suggested adding language that very explicitly says that if the committee votes to streamline the process, we can for routine matters. And if it's an emergency, we don't have to go through the whole long process there. So that's what the changes there are regarding. So, and you'll notice that there is some language deleted as well. <clears throat> Again, if you have questions. So the next one is budget transfers, which is, um, this is, um, about funds that need to be transferred between accounts. And in the past, I believe that while we do approve a bottom line appropriation budget, Oftentimes, if there was a transfer between what you've, what you've heard the, the Department of Revenue accounts, that if it says we're transferring from the 2,000 account to the 4,000 account or something like that, so in other words, if we're taking money out of salaries and putting it into supplies or maintenance or something, the school committee needs to vote. The, change, the recommended changes here are saying that we will authorize the superintendent to make transfers of less than $10,000 or as long as they're not being done to create a new position or a new position. <coughs> yeah. Sure. Can I just suggest that um, the first sentence is actually not a sentence the way it stands, that maybe you add a period after funds and eliminate the word R? <laughs> no, I think it's just a typo. I think that... Yeah, probably. But just before we actually vote on it. It should read, the school committee recognizes the need for periodic adjustments of the budget by transferring funds or transfers of funds, period. Right, so just strike the R. Then. <coughs> so we just need a little grammatical help there. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, so um, it says transfers requiring school committee approval, so those that are for a new program are or position or that are over $10,000 will continue to be submitted to the school committee. And um, the other notable addition here 
is that um, it, this policy would specify that before the end of each fiscal year, the school committee would vote and grant the superintendent and, or his or her designee the authority without the above restrictions to transfer funds to close the books, which is to say that if there are transfers that within the budget that need to be made to even out the accounts and make everything close in the black, that they would be allowed to do that considering that we have fewer meetings <clears throat> and more people on vacation. So those are the changes that are recommended to that policy. Okay. And finally, public gifts to the schools. Um, and again, the changes are highlighted in yellow and the other things are, are have a line through them so that you can see what we are talking about getting rid of. Um, the superintendent, uh, it, first of all, the school committee used to have the authority to accept all gifts. This says that the superintendent will have the authority to accept gifts with a value not to exceed $1,000. Um, gifts with a value of greater than $1,000 would be presented to the school committee for approval. Principals who were not listed in our policy at all previously would now have the authority to, to accept all gifts with a total value not to exceed $1,000 from their PTOs. So they were here this evening. So in the, I, think that, I think that in the past, we didn't have any rules about it. it j stuff just happened. This is formalizing and codifying what we would like to see happen. So there will still be gifts from PTOs to schools that will be accepted by the principal but they would be of a certain dollar amount. Um, on the, um, Ms. Minnick, you know how when the bank, if it reports to the government if it's 10,000, so people get around it by 9,500, 9,500, 9,500. I'm thinking of that with the $1,000. I mean, we didn't really look at that at rules and policy, but um, $999 for this, you know I mean? Can the principal just sit there and accept 12 999 dollar gifts because none of them went over a thousand and I know that it's that I don't believe that they would do it because I think it's the you know the what is it, ethics of the law or whatever morality there but I mean I'm just saying since we're writing it into policy what's to prevent that well, so you make it 990 and then people will do 989 I'm not sure that there's a way to get around what you <coughs> what you're saying mm -hmm. and I also think this is not like campaign contributions this is you know, gifts to the schools. We're just saying that if it's not more than a thousand dollars, the school committee doesn't actively have to approve it, but the principal does have to approve it. And a report of gifts accepted, um, it doesn't. It says by the superintendent. Right at the very bottom. That's what I, was ask you next. I wonder if we shouldn't change that to say a gifts accepted by the superintendent and our principals mm -hmm. should be listed and reported, um, and that way we would know what was going on. And, and on a regular basis, did, um, what, what do you consider a regular basis? Like quarterly, um, We yearly? discussed that at our meeting and right. it, was, it was a situation so where discussing here. there could be, if we could go for six months with nothing and then it could be monthly, we would have three or four each mm -hmm. month. So I think we're trusting um, the superintendent's interpretation when, when there is a significant number Okay, and well, I don't know what constitutes a significant number, but perhaps it's monthly unless there isn't one. Well, and the reason I'm asking about a regular basis is because that some of the things are um, not only of interest, like, oh, by the way, this happened, but actually have ongoing interest of do we want this to happen and something to think about. So that's why I'm saying it on a regular basis. I mean, it'd be great to go, oh, the ski trip did such and such, and they're, you know, talking about in August. I'd like you know, something more we could say that the uh, superintendent will make a report of all gifts except by the superintendent and or principals at our regularly scheduled monthly meeting and if there is no report then I like there wasn't that. anything so I don't I don't know if that makes sense I don't know what the I don't know how busy this is going to be. Well, I know that in the rules and policy meeting, we discussed that. I'm on the subcommittee also. We discussed that. But one of the things that we discussed was that it might be something that the whole board would discuss so we didn't really break it down harshly. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm kind of bringing it up now because I don't agree. I don't agree with myself. <laughs> Do you have a question, Mr. Moore? Yeah, I just I was thinking the regular basis, I think it's reasonable to say something like it, you know, at the 
at the subsequent meeting. Or, you know, because I think that's, that's sort of the, the point of it is to be able to give public recognition for the gifts exactly. as, well as, as, as well as sort of letting us know about the things which otherwise might just happen and no, you know, we wouldn't know but also nobody would know and it's, I think it's really valuable for people to know, you know, that's the public recognition portion and I think it's better if it's timely, in other words, happening as, as it occurs as opposed to sort of an end of year report. Um, so the, now that this is already in the, in the chute, <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> loaded um, for consideration, if it's all okay with you, I'll just bring up that as an amendment to this policy when we actually vote on it. But mm -hmm. rather than sending it back to the subcommittee for revision before it's brought to you again, I don't want to delay the process any further. So. Okay. So, um, any other questions on those? Uh, yes, Ms. I, she hadn't finished reading them. I, I asked her a question directly about the up top. She hadn't gotten to the uh, middle of it. Um, okay, but I think, did you have a question, Ms. Fallon? Well, so I thought the first reading we weren't asking questions. I thought we were supposed to ask questions at the second reading. So my question is actually about the last policy. <laughs> is that a problem? Not at all. I just didn't understand where we were saying the Budget Transfer Authority that at the end of each fiscal year, the school committee um, shall vote and grant the superintendent the authority without the above restrictions to transfer <coughs> funds to close the fiscal year books. So we're granting the superintendent the authority to transfer More money in order to create a new position or program? Because that, isn't that one of the above restrictions? Yes. It is one of the above restrictions, but the policy says specifically this is to close the books at the right. end of the year. So you wouldn't be creating a new position to call Okay, I just didn't understand why why it was worded that way. Uh, it, it's really to get around the $10,000 limit because typically at the end of the year you have accounts that are in excess or deficit of more than 10,000. There's often many of them and it would be both tedious and um, impractical to bring all of those for request for approval to you. Just to close the books. Okay. Well, just without the above restrictions was what was problematic for me. Mm -hmm. Maybe, so maybe it would be clear if it said above the, without the above $10,000 limit, I, something like that. that makes I'm sense. not a lawyer, I'm just saying. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> without a monetary restriction. Such a yeah. Okay. All right, Did so you, that can be, that can be looked at. making a note of that so you'll yeah. remind me so that we can get the so, um, proper. So you have more to tell about the uh, she didn't finish gifts? Reading. One. Um, and not really. I mean, I think people can read the highlighted things. Um, but also, it's for a matter of um, public record, since we're doing it for the first reading. If, I mean, you're almost done. Okay. They, they are posted online if somebody wants to read them. It does say, uh, and one of the other changes would be that the district reserves the right to dispose of any donated property that's, property that's no longer needed or considered too costly to maintain. And um, the Perhaps one of the most significant portions of this is um, based on interpretation by the city solicitor and, um, and our <coughs> business manager and superintendent about problematic language that had to do with gifts and whether or not we had to use them according to the donor's wishes. And it had been interpreted that we could the, the wording that was there said any gift of cash, whether or not intended by the donor for a specific person, will be handled as a separate account and expended at the discretion of the committee as provided by law. And some had interpreted that as meaning we could use it for whatever we wanted to. And that was just problematic enough that we have recommended changing the language to read now, any gift of cash received by the school committee shall depo be deposited with the city treasurer and held as a separate account and expended by the committee for the donor's intended purpose without further appropriation, which means that it doesn't require the vote of the city council or anyone else for us to expend the money. And the lawyer's interpretation of at our discretion was that we didn't have to check with anyone else. We could, but because it says at our discretion, it was just too, too unclear and people were concerned that we could just go off and go Party. to Hawaii as a group or something. So we, have, we are suggesting, 
different language that makes clear that we, do, we are going to follow donors' wishes to the extent possible, and, but that we can do so without any further vote from anyone else or any permission from anyone else. So those were the changes to that particular policy. Okay. I would like to suggest that the policy on policies, I didn't, didn't specifically say this. I think it's, I think that the policy that, the way it had been interpreted in the past, it shows three steps. Information item, which is distributed with the agenda, and discussion of the policy, and, you know, reports from any advisory committee or know, recommendations by the superintendent, and then action item. And I think a number of people have interpreted that as being three separate things. In my interpretation, if it goes out with the agenda for this meeting and we just discussed it um, and looked for recommendations from the superintendent at this current meeting, then we can vote on it at our next meeting. So by my interpretation, it really only requires two meetings plus notice in advance when you received the thing with the agenda. I, I, the, the controversial language there was before those items number one, two, and three, it said follow the following sequence at successive meetings, which would make it sound like it did actually take three meetings to get through the list, which is really kind of a cumbersome process for some of our policies, which is so particularly if it's just cleaning up language if we've changed the, um, if we're changing the transportation policy to say that we're no longer going to pick people up at a mile and a half, we're going to two miles, that's the only change. I don't see why we have to go through three months of talking about it. If it's something that's controversial, that we feel that there's a need for public forum on something, then it makes sense that we would take plenty of time to inform the community about it. But if it's something that's housekeeping or something that's required by the state, we have to have the policy. There's no reason for it to take three months in my mind. So this was, this was an attempt to streamline the process slightly. Dr. Provost, just want to make a comment. I just wanted to um, make an observation which I think supports Ms. Minnick's point. Um, even though we're currently under the old version <coughs> of the policy on policies, I think all four of them that were presented only for information tonight have all been discussed and recommendations for modification have been done. So I, I really think that the idea of distributing them and not talking about them is unrealistic unless we're going to have a very high level of discipline. And I think that it's um, unnecessary because it still provides the public with an opportunity to know we're talking about it and provides the members with an opportunity to reflect on it before making a final vote. Ms. Duvall. Well, as I can understand that all, I do have a question um, for you, Mayor. In City Council, they take three readings on everything. Two. Two readings. It's two, so that's what it is. And, and so that's what we're, why do we take three here was my question. Do you know? I, I don't know. Okay. It never really says reading. Right to read rule. Well, I know but we've reading. always kind of went. I know, but we always kind of do the three with we, the, the we policy. We really haven't. We've only done two, and it wasn't until Dr. Provost came and looked at our policy and he said that he thought we might actually be in violation of our own policy because it stated that we were supposed to follow these three steps at successive meetings, and so that's why we decided that we wanted to fix it so that it really only requires two right. readings and the information part is just sending out the policy with the agenda so that you can read it before you get here. Okay. Thank you. So city council only does two also, so we're still right in line with the city government. That's correct. Perfect. They occasionally, you, don't have to you know, mm -hmm. occasionally okay. it'll be on their agenda, they'll refer it to committees and then it'll come back and then they'll do two, two readings, readings. but that's, that's the only difference but they're actually only debating and taking two votes on it I mean two final votes on it sometimes they re they say um, invoke rule 30 or something suspend like that rule. suspend rule 30 <laughs> they right. sometimes will take two votes on one night they I mean this body has the ability to suspend its rules if it needed to if there was some if we had to have a rule in place by January 1st I we could suspend rules and do that you could suspend your own rules 
So rules are made to be suspended. <laughs> I, don't know the, I don't know what the old saying is. Uh, so, yeah. but, uh, different variation on that. Rather, uh, rather than, so ra well, I suppose that's one of the options under this. It says that we can streamline this process if it's an emergency. So it, we can dispense with the above sequence to meet emergency conditions. So you could say we will vote twice at, or we will can bring it up in the beginning of a meeting and then vote later in the meeting or you could say anyone. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, so this constitutes your first reading. They've been well read and so we'll bring this back to you at your next meeting and um, <coughs> we'll proceed from there. So now we have the vote. This is a vote this uh, time on the um, Wellmec position statement and I'll turn this over to our colleague, uh, Ms. Hanna Hennessy. Sure, this was uh, something we talked about or I presented in March on the Western Massachusetts Education Leaders Coalition to have us um, sign on to their position statement, which essentially expressed their concern about the um, amount, pace, and cost of unfunded mandates, the reliability, validity, and implementation of the park test, and the amount, frequency, and cost of standardized tests. So by voting yes, we would um, essentially have Dr. Provost um, write a letter to Todd Gazda, who is the superintendent of Ludlow Schools and the chair of this committee, um, saying that we agree on this and we would sign our names, the committee's name to this. Okay. So uh, do you wish to make a, make a motion? Like to make a motion for us to um, sign on to this position statement for the motion right? for a resolution can we do that is it is it a resolution is what we're looking for right uh, it's a there's it's a there's a language that yes. we're supposed to be adopting that's the the language that they that they've put Move forward to make a resolution supporting the Western Massachusetts Education Leaders Coalition position statement second, second. Uh, and we've discussed this at previous meetings. Is there any dis further discussion this evening about it? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that is adopted, and uh, we'll proceed uh, with that. Thank you, Ms. Hennessy, for you. your work on that. Uh, now we move into the FY uh, 2016 budget. Um, and so I know, I don't know, Dr. Provost, if you have any additional um, information you wish to provide or any, um, any, anything, any other questions that have come in that you've had to respond to? There have been no further questions. We've had three public discussions about it. I don't think I have anything further to add at this point. Okay. <coughs> and, um, okay. So why don't we, um, why don't we, to get this on the table, um, ask the chair to make a motion, uh, the vice chair to make a motion. Actually, I think that's the recommended motion um, to <coughs> make a motion to, yeah. Okay. Um, so I would like to make a motion to approve the FY16 Northampton school budget as presented with an appropriated amount of $27,144,501. To include the recommended adjustments should the kindergarten grant remain unfunded. Second. Okay. So again, that is um, that is that's an approval of the budget, but with a contingency that um, that if the kindergarten grant does not survive the House and Senate uh, versions and the final state budget, that then there would be the the um, the contingency uh, adjustments that would have to be made. So. Does anyone uh, have any further questions or comments uh, before we take this vote? Um, I, for one, obviously want to thank Dr. Provost and, and uh, the school business administrator for all their work on this. I know it was not only uh, creating a budget, but, but creating a new format for the budget and, and really trying to incorporate um, uh, you know, some new, um, a, a new way of um, presenting it and, and creating the cost center approach um, at each of the schools um, and so obviously you know thank you to both of you for the work you did um, to do that and also just your willingness to answer all the questions not only that the school committee members had but also you know the me members of the public so um, thank you for that and um, and thank you for getting it done uh, uh, 
on t uh, early and on time so that we can incorporate it into the final uh, school budget. So those are just my comments. Any other comments from anyone else? Okay. I would only reiterate what has been said at previous meetings, and that is the, um, the, um, the foresight and uh, forward seeing of future years and budgets um, and how, how uh, pleased I am that the superintendent, along with the business administrator, worked to craft a budget that uh, didn't have just a one-year cited plan, but also aligns itself with the city side and the uh, override funds that were established a few years ago with an effort to try to hold off cuts for as long as possible to our students. <laughs> Uh, and their, well, to their, their teachers so that our students can um, have the, the educational experience that we all so much treasure here in Northampton. So I appreciate that, both of you. Any other comments? Oh, Mr. Meyer. Um, I, I just want to say, though, this budget season has been um, easier than during the economic downturn that still um, the thing that unnerves me is to look at the trajectory of the yes. budget. Again, without any reform at the state level, uh, which, if anything, we've gone in the opposite direction with a reduction from $25 um, per student, the generous $25 down to $20, even though the governor cast this as increased funding for education, that it, we're looking at deficits by 2018 or 2019, which is not that far in the future, um, and, and that that's um, in attempting to keep those deficits farther out in the future, um, we are putting the district in a position where we will not be able to add additional programming that we know, that we recognize that we need, we recognize that it would provide our students and our community um, with better education. So that's, well, I think that right now we're, we're in as good a situation as we can be. I'm, I'm still hoping that in that interim, four or five years that leaders at the state level provide some sort of relief for municipalities and school districts to provide the education that Massachusetts should have. I second that. <laughs> Mr. Moore. I, I, uh, I want to add on to, I think it's really, uh, it was an easy year to do it, so I think it's sort of a test run for what may happen when we have more contentious years to come when there, if, if funding is decreased, when we, you know, in a few years when and we'll be closer to the wall, but I think it was really good um, that uh, the pe members of the public were able to send in and did actually send in questions. I think that shows a really good level of engagement, and um, and I hope we'll be able to use that as a model for when we have more contentious issues to be able to similarly be able to have the public ask questions in a, in a way which allows our administrators to answer them. Um, as opposed to simply butting heads um, in a less productive sort of fashion where there's you know, less thought, with less time and so on. So I really, I think it was a good model for how we can do it. Um, and I think we need to continue to build that model, sort of take advantage of the kind of law right now where we have fairly, seem to have fairly stable stuff, which as Downey points out, is stable to a lower <coughs> level than we'd like to be, but nonetheless is stable. Um, because we will be coming to a place in a few years, and unless the state does, be, you know, sort of step up um, differently, um, if, this, if things continue stable, we end up doing being able to do less, and it will become, again, more of a resource struggle. And um, I hope we can keep the kind of processes that I think really were pretty productive this year in place for when there are, you know, a bigger tug of war going on. Can I say quick? Sure. I'm sorry. Three, three quick, quick things. Oh, so the first is the, the thank. The floor is yours. Or, I mean, we're, we're approving a $27 yeah. million dollar budget. I think you can say, everyone um, should take the time I, to say what they want to say. That, you know, it is a community and the work of Prickly here. Um, but that it's also the PTOs that are really funding so many programs that we just have to recognize that mm -hmm. um, this community has really kind of risen to support what we can't do. And the most important point I want to make is what Downey just made that, you know, this we have to as a community recognize that we've got to put pressure on the state to change the priorities and start funding education. 
because we're losing incredible programs, and this is not just Northampton. We just live in a community that's you know, able to fund some of the stuff, and then we've just gotta do that. So thank you for your work, and just I wanna end on that. Okay, any other uh, comments or questions before we vote? Okay, so, um, so you have a motion before you. Again, this is to approve the, uh, the Northampton school budget for FY 2016. It's uh, 27 million, 144, 501. And again, it allows for the recommended adjustment should the kindergarten grant remain unfunded at the end of the, uh, the state budget process. Um, I will ask for a roll call vote on this, just given the, it's the school budget. <coughs> Yes or yay? Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. Aye. Yes. Yes. Aye. Yes. Okay. So the, uh, the fiscal year 2016 uh, budget for the Northampton Public Schools is adopted. So next on the agenda, we have, um, find my agenda, okay, uh, we have the business administrator's report. Well, following the budget, nothing's gonna compare. Yes. <laughs> it's actually a very short report tonight. You have your regular monthly report on the budget. Um, if there's questions, I can try to answer those for you. And then I actually had referred to the fact that the bus bid was going to be awarded tonight, which we did successfully do earlier tonight. And that bid actually came in under our budget. So that also has helped out our long going budget projection. This is the purchase of the, the 30 passenger wheelchair bus. Yeah. Okay. Any questions uh, about that? How about the personnel report? It's, I guess it was included in our packet, so okay, we can. Yeah. Um, There's no report. Oh. Um, oh, so. Can I just say, so these end of the year budget transfers that we're talking about, is I see that <coughs> $223,000. Oh. Yes. Oh, is, is that a concern, or you guys can just trans we can transfer that? Yes, we can cover it. Uh, to, to go back a couple of meetings. No, they're going to take up a collection of the school, the school committee. committee. Yes. Phew. Utilities, half of our utilities are actually budgeted in school choice this year. Okay. So I've chosen to move those all into the local budget so we start to build the consistent history. And we, we'll be moving other expenses into the school choice funds. That's what I thought. I just wanted to okay. Okay. And, um, and I believe we have the personnel report. So unless there's any questions, I'll just. Uh, can accept that as accepted by the committee. I don't know that you have to read it. Um, and then I will then move to the superintendent's report. Thank you very much. Given the late hour, I will keep my remarks short. But I need to start by um, speaking directly to Amelia Tamayo and her parents. Um, she is a student who invited me to come to JFK a few weeks ago in order to read some of her poetry to me. Um, and it was, I'm saying this as an English major and a former English teacher, um, some of the most <coughs> incredible poetry I'd ever heard at any level. Um, she's a bilingual student and her poems are both in English and Spanish. And um, she competed in the scholastic competition and she was uh, a winner at the national level of a silver medal. And so she and her family will be traveling to Carnegie Hall in the month of June um, to perform her poetry um, for that audience. So um, good job. Um, next, I'd like to recognize our Grinspoon Pioneer Valley Excellence in Teaching Award winners. Our winners this year are Barbara Bitgood, Northampton High School French teacher, Amelia Perea, a JFK eighth grade math teacher. He's the winner in our new teacher category. Michelle Subas, Ephraim Leeds Elementary, fifth grade teacher, and Martha Hopkins, a special educator at Bridge Street School. The, um, the award dinner will be April 29th at 530 at the Log Cabin. School committee members are welcome. The cost of the ticket is $30. Um, and you can contact me or Tracy if you're interested in going. 
Next, I'd like to also um, give a shout out to the ABC Darians who competed in the spelling bee competition. I think the name was both uh, humorous and appropriate for the school committee. And although you were not successful, you fought all the way. And I was proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I would just like to thank everybody who um, took part in the coordinated program review. You saw from the binders um, that Ms. Farkas presented earlier tonight, it's, it's quite an extensive process. You saw from the interview schedules that were included in your packets that this is something that involved all levels of the school department. And um, I'll tell you that my exit interview also was very positive. Um, and I think that they will, they will validate much of what was in the entry findings. And I think they were impressed that we were able to find out some of those things without waiting for them to do a compliance review. Um, also, speaking of root of um, entry findings, the ALT team is currently in the process of root cause analysis. We'll be reporting in May on our root causes, and we'll, that will begin the process of developing a new district improvement plan. So I've been telling just about every group of teachers and other members of the public that um, I've been able to um, have contact with lately that I will be recruiting vigorously um, for people who want to serve on the committee to develop the new district improvement plan. So um, there'll be more forthcoming on that. Also, um, tomorrow night we begin a new tradition with the first arts night in at Northampton High School from 6 to 8 o'clock. Um, I think that's going to be a very interesting event and I encourage everyone to attend. Also, I'll just remind everyone that April 11th through the 18th is Brain Building in Progress Week, as we were, I'm told, in oh so many wonderful ways at the beginning of this meeting. Um, so I encourage everyone who's interested to show up at Jackson Street School at 10 a.m. on Saturday morning. Also, um, just sort of echoing some of the comments that <coughs> Mr. Moore made earlier about um, having conversations in ways that were conducive for productive dialogue rather than butting heads. Um, I want to note that we have a parent math night scheduled for Monday, April 13th at, from 7.30 to 9 at JFK. This was a meeting um, that was requested by parents and um, one of the things that they presented to me along with the request was that they felt in the past parents had been very aggressive and district administrators had been very defensive. Uh, so they wanted to have a conversation in a way that felt emotionally and psychologically safe for everybody. Um, so this is actually something that um, got picked up in the entry findings. There's a sentence from that you may um, re recall where I wrote, with respect to this topic in particular, speaking of the math program, the sense one gets is that many of the communications have been uh, communication attempts have only been partially successful because the discussions were more characteristic of mutual efforts at persuasion rather than a genuine search for common understandings. So this discussion is um, designed around a set of ground rules that um, I believe will make everybody feel safe. Um, the parents have submitted their questions in advance. The administrators will be speaking on those questions directly. And we really want to we really want to have a night that is just informational. Um, it's not an attempt for people of whatever point of view to try to prove their point of view. It's just a night to have questions that have a basis and a response that's factual to get factual responses out. Um, so if you're interested in that topic, um, we'll be meeting here on Monday, 730. Um, and then also, with respect to some upcoming events, um, one of the things the Prevention Coalition um, has heard is that the motivational techniques that we use for interviewing kids in order to get information about behaviors that may not be healthy are techniques that parents might want to have because sometimes it's difficult to know exactly how to talk to your child about behaviors that he or she may not feel comfortable disclosing to you. Um, so um, we are doing a training for parents on motivational interviewing. It's going to be held May 16th 
from 10.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Collaborative for Educational Services. And if anybody is interested in participating in that free training for parents, I would encourage you to contact Paul McNeil at the high school. And then finally, uh, I would note that we're about to launch two searches for administrative positions, one for an uh, associate principal at JFK and one for a new food service director. And if there are any school committee members who are interested in serving on the um, search committees, although neither of these positions is appointed by the school committee, um, please let the mayor know. And that's my report. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Provost. Uh, we don't have any new business this evening, and we will be uh, returning to our regular uh, schedule uh, in May. So our next meeting is uh, May 14th here at JFK at 7.15 p.m. I uh, will now entertain a motion Move to, to adjourn. adjourn. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The school committee meeting is adjourned. What was that thing